Welcome to Canada's most irreverent talk show. This is the Andrew Lawton Show, brought to you by True North. Hello and welcome everyone to the Andrew Lawton Show, a Friday edition of the program here on True North, wrapping up the week on this July 21st. Hope you're enjoying, I think we're now one month into summer, so it's a third of the way over. If there's anything you want to do, you got to get it done in the next two months. We have talked a lot on this program about the sometimes, and I would say increasingly impossible litmus tests that are applied to people in our political age. It's not just uh, people who are alive and well today, as we've discussed at length, historical figures are subject to an impossible hurdle as well. But one of the biggest and I would say most dangerous aspects of cancel culture has been that it does not take the old line from, I think I remember if it was Margaret Thatcher or Ronald Reagan, that your 80% friend should not be your 20% enemy. Increasingly, it is a 100% compliance that is required. Otherwise, you find yourself exiled by the very people to whom you may have devoted your life up until that point. One example that is easy to bring up in this regard is J.K. Rowling, a tremendous author who has, uh, in many respects, checked every single box expected of her as a woman of the left. She's a feminist. She supports gay rights. She's advocated for, in general, the misfits of society. Her books changed the world. They changed people's lives. But she deviated on one key issue from those folks and has found herself now uh, disavowed and denounced by the very people who held her up as a model. Well, a very similar thing has happened to a gentleman that I'm very pleased to be speaking with on this show, except I would say uh, he has even more pronounced left-wing credentials than J.K. Rowling does and has similarly on the gender issue found it to be a point of division between him and those uh, he's surrounded himself with for most of his life. His name is Dr. Stuart Parker. He's the president of the Los Altos Institute out of British Columbia. And for a self-avowed Marxist, it was a bit odd to see him with an essay in the McDonald Laurier Institute's website, which I would encourage you to read. It's called Intolerant Authoritarians of the New Left. And this is Stuart Parker for Inside Policy. And he joins me now. Stuart, wonderful to talk to you. Thanks very much for coming on today. Well, thanks very much, and thank you for tolerating my many uh, technical and scheduling issues getting onto this call. It's, um, it's really nice to be here. Well, I'm glad. I should just warn you and the audience that there is a, a hailstorm outside of my home right now. So if we end up having to abruptly stop and restart due to a connection issue, we will do so. But thankfully, this is not live. So we're able to have a, a bit of flexibility in, in that regard. I, I want to talk about your political views just for a moment to situate this, because what I, I read your accounting of them and also some of the positions held by your think tank, you're not just one of these like garden variety variety, nondescript center leftist. Like you're about as far left as it comes in Canadian politics. And even I would say outside of that. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think that, um, I mean, the thing is, if you're very far on the left or very far in any political direction, you're one of two kinds of people. You're either a person who has a very small world and leads a sectarian life, or you're a person who knows how to do broad coalition politics because you can't rely on agreeing with most people about most things. So yeah, I, um, you know, I, I, you know, I'm a pretty far radical environmentalist on the whole climate file and all the other stuff. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm a Marxist. I, I, not in terms of like believing everything Marx says, because that would be like weird and religious, but um, but in terms of like using uh, his work and the corpus of work around him as my primary political analysis tool. Yeah, I'm I'm pretty much your like uh, standard, um, you know, eco communist and. Uh, so it's been an interesting journey the past few years, discovering that I'm actually supposedly a conservative. 
Yeah, not just a conservative, but far right, and in some cases, a quote, literal Nazi, unquote. So uh, when did those labels first get applied to you? What was the, the context in which that emerged? Well, I think, um, I mean, I've been in, involved in a public cancellation campaign now for three years. There have been six public campaigns to cancel me. But when I became aware that I could be described as such things, it was before the cancellation. One of the things that I, I think a lot of people who end up being canceled and they make a virtue of their cancellation is that you end up like over narrating that. You end up describing yourself perhaps as more courageous or interesting than you actually are. So from 2015 to 2019, I gradually became aware that the left was becoming increasingly intolerant and that if I expressed unorthodox views, there would be consequences. And so I deliberately began dissembling, lying about my views back in 2015 um, because I was aware that there was this new intolerant orthodox movement that was taking over the left. And my hope was that I could wait it out. If I could just sort of like not tell people how I disagreed with the orthodoxy, maybe this would go away. But of course the opposite happened. So it was really in 2020 when um, I was the leader of the BC Eco-Socialist Party right, whose motto was greener than the Greens and further left than the NDP. That, that was our motto. And we went into the 2020 provincial general election. But the whole party was a stupid idea, just flat out. Like if you if I'd actually like said out loud what I was doing, I would have known how stupid it was because a millionaire had paid me to create a socialist party for him. Like, how is that going to go? Um, so uh, my old friend, Jeff Berner, who was a friend uh, once upon a time, you know, I'm sort of with John Cleese there. Every relationship has a clock on it. Um, but he was, you know, he's a traveling uh, klezmer accordion act and um, a friend of Billy Bragg. And so even before gender wang and the extreme orthodoxy arrived here, he'd been dealing with that on tour. And so when I was working with him on creating the eco-socialist party, we had this confrontation over a particular thing he wanted to put in the party's policy. I was willing to go along with a lot of this bullshit until we had to take a vote on whether his wife who was a prominent gender doctor here in Vancouver, uh, like a well-known local quack. Mm -hmm. um, she was going to write our policy and we had to approve it sight unseen. And one of the few points of the policy that I'd already been arguing with Jeff about was the idea that if people who decide, who come to believe in the gender cult and decide they're the wrong gender, and then they, you know, get parts of their body cut off and they take these weird drugs and they go, you know what, this is actually making me feel better. If they detransition, the thing was that it was essential that we go into the election saying that those people should be cut off Medicare. And I just thought, well, that's incredibly cruel. You tell these young people a lie you tell them that they have an immortal, indetectable, pre-existent gendered soul that has been born into the wrong body. And now we have to do a whole bunch of cosmetic surgery and amputations and alter the structure of the person's brain. Um, and if people, if that doesn't work for people, they shouldn't get health care ever again. I, I couldn't live with that. That was so extreme. It was so savage. It was so bizarre that I went, all right, that's enough. I can't go any further down this path. And uh, so 
Um, Jeff threatened the party that, that he would destroy us publicly and in the public square by outing our opposition to gender way. And that's how the cancellation campaigns against me began was that, um, uh, and this is a really important thing to understand mm -hmm. about what's going on on the left. This gender nonsense is the left's sole boundary maintenance structure. The idea is that, and, and it, its position always changes, like it's not a consistent ideology. It's just madness and lunacy and new pharmaceuticals and new medical procedures. And the thing is, you're not measured on what you believe as part of the left because gender weighing is a moving target. What, what you have to do in order to be recognized as part of the left is agree in advance to the next crazy thing the genderists will do or say. And so we're in this environment where any dissent from this constantly shifting orthodoxy is viewed as leaving the left. We're undergoing a period of rapid, rapid social change. And human beings don't like rapid change. And so we create social coping strategies for rapid change. Among conservatives, a favored strategy is neo-traditionalism, where you turn the thing that you're changing into, when you, when you re-describe the rapid change as a return to an imagined past. So whether you're thinking about neo-traditionalist indigenous hereditary chiefs, who are describing some kind of return to a past in which we're harmonious with the earth and we live off the land and, 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 and we're not involved in this industrial society, or whether you're listening to Trump supporters saying, make America great again, conservatives manage change by describing the thing they have to change into as a return to the past. The left progressives supposedly love change, but they actually can't handle it. And so what progressives have been doing for the past eight years, I would say, is using tribalism rather than neo-traditionalism. And so the way you measure whether someone is part of the left is whether they follow the other members of the tribe into whatever the new crazy thing is. And there are no guardrails on that. Yeah, and, and just on that, I mean, you, you touch on this in your, your essay, and I, I think it's an important point that a lot of these values now are used for social organization, whereas the left that you came up in, that you have been a part of for the last 35 years, the core values were applied to a particular change. I mean, you're an environmentalist and you do that because you want to make change. You want to go after the oil companies. You want to go after the plastic manufacturers, go after the miners. You believe in socialism. So you go after the capitalists and after the corporations. But but there's actually an, an action component there that is trying to manifest that belief in the real world. And, and you, you make a point here in your piece that I, I wanted to quote. You said, Progressive society under woke hegemony has become post-political. It has ceased to have meaningful political demands since the rise of mid-2010s mid hashtag politics, defund the police, land back, me too, are not political ideas. They impersonate politics. Wokes do not make policy proposals and have no capacity to assemble the broad coalitions necessary to enact policy through democratic processes. And, and you go on to elaborate on that a little bit, but I, I thought that was a particularly poignant uh, point here you raised, because you're basically saying that the louder the left has become now, the less they've actually wanted to be a part of any of the solutions to the problems they claim are pervasive in society. Right, because fundamentally the left is acting from despair. 
My political mentor, David Lewis, not the NDP guy, the um, crazy man who uh, lived in Crescent Valley and was like a professional firewood collector and giant. One of the things that he, um, he said that I have found has guided me through a lot of these political waters is he said, he would say to people who proposed, I would say post-political things, he would say, you lack the faith that humanity will rise to the occasion. And fundamentally, I think the left is a, a movement gripped by despair. It's why I've written three opinion pieces about J.R.R. Tolkien's theory of hope, because the left has become disgusting and bizarre because the people in it have actually stopped hoping to change the world. They don't think it's possible. They think their horizon of expectation is foreclosed. And so to people on the left, um, they look at the world and they go, well, that's all broken. Who can we find to punish for that? because clearly we can't fix it. And it's that despair that has spread through the left that has created our modern cancel culture. Because yes, they lack political demands. I remember um, at the crescendo of Me Too, and you know, like, you know, I was interfered with as a kid, I had some things to say, but what I noticed during the Me Too movement, which is really the beginning of all this, Right, there are all of these people coming forward going, I was molested in this way, I was abused in this way, I was exploited in this way. And what did they seek? They sought to punish individuals. They had no social solution. The left had become so full of despair, they couldn't imagine a society in which fewer women would be raped next year in which fewer children would be sexually interfered with next year. All they could hope to do was punish individuals for specific crimes. And Mia Kirshner, who, uh, you know, you know, I was born in the right year to think she's like the most beautiful woman of the Canadian cinema, um, wrote this essay. And obviously I was going to read it. It's a Mia Kirshner essay, and she doesn't write opinion pieces. And she wrote this piece for the Globe and Mail during Me Too, where she said, look, there are very simple things we can do to reduce the level of sexual violence in the movie industry. We can prohibit this through state law. We can prohibit this through trade union contracts. And she produced this enormous list of things we could actually do to solve the problem we were supposedly addressing. And no one picked up on that. No one said, what about moving our horizons beyond firing Harvey Weinstein mm -hmm. and creating a world in which there will never be another Harvey Weinstein? And other than Sarah Pauly and Mia Kirshner, um, I didn't see anybody in the movie industry take that step. And that was really the harbinger of where we were going to go. That the left isn't doing politics, it's given up on politics. The energy that people on the left would have put into knocking on doors or phoning people or taking meetings with civil society organizations they might sway to their side has been put into immiserating individuals not to solve problems, but to punish people for the existence of problems, the left no longer has the self-confidence to think it can solve. In your left, though, was there ever room for dissent? Because, I mean, conservatives in Canada especially don't agree on e with, any, with each other on anything. Like, would, would internal debate have been a thing for most of your last 35 years in, in left-wing activism, or was everyone pretty much on the same page on, on every issue? I mean, the left was a site of debate. It, like, if I were to make a criticism of the old left, the left that I'm now, 
you know, it's amazing what you can get nostalgic for. Like, I want the Berlin Wall back at this point. Um, I, uh, you know, the big problem the left had was that it was primarily a site of debate. It was a, a, a cacophony of different voices proposing different solutions for the ills that ailed society. That was what the left was. And we, we laughed at ourselves over that. We laughed over the fact that everything was up for debate, that we were always in some kind of debate, that the deliberation never ended. And so to go from that to a completely orthodox society that has no tolerance for debate, um, I have whiplash. Like, I can't recognize the movement I was part of. Because being on the right, I look at this as being the left starting to apply to itself the same tools that it seemed to be content applying to the right for many years. And, and a lot of people on the left were completely fine with cancel culture until they learned that it might actually start uh, pointing in their direction. And I'm, I'm curious which side of that you were on. Were you ever the kind that celebrated the demise of, of your political opponents, that celebrated their cancellation? And, and, or, or was this something that you had always a bit of discomfort with? I I I I I am not going to claim that I was a highly virtuous person on the left, but the thing you're talking about was never my thing. You know, I became part of the left, like Jeff Bernard, the guy who first canceled me. We became friends when we were five. Hmm. And we we organized a group of kids who would side with each other when we were being bullied. Like, to me, that's what the core of left organizing is. It, it, like, that's, that, that was constitutionally what it was all about. It was about you get people who are under-resourced and scared, and we, we form into a team and we side against the bullies. So from the beginning when cancellation began as a phenomenon, my attitude was never to celebrate it. It was always just this irrational hope that it would blow over. Hmm. That I wouldn't get into the fight. That people would realize how useless and self-destructive it was. But one of the problems, and you know, my, my old friend George Gibault made an excellent observation about 20th century politics. We were talking about because he was a conservative. I was a I was a leftist and um, he was a brilliant man. One of the best political strategists the West has ever seen. And um, he said, you know, I think you might be the only Burkean Marxist in the world. <laughs> but um, Jibot, basically, he his um, his thing, his, what his argument was that we reached our best politics in the 1970s when the right was being led by people who escaped from the Soviet Union and the left was being led by people who had survived the Great Depression. And this was about decent people acting on their historical experience. The, of the victims something. of capitalism versus the victims of communism, basically. Yes, exactly. And the, the, those were the, that, that was the best moment in our politics because it wasn't driven by some desire to remake the world. It was driven by a desire to prevent other people from experiencing a form of suffering no one should have to experience. And so what I would say about the left today, one of the reasons it's become possible to take this turn is that the survivors of McCarthyism are dead. One of the things I did last year was I interviewed Don Todd, who was a communist philosopher in the 1950s. And he led a big, zesty life. But he was discharged from the military in the middle of the Korean War, where he was fighting communism because he was a communist. Mm -hmm. And he spent eight years on the blacklist and it was very helpful um, to talk with him about this because 
he could tell me how I was supposed to live, what the things were that I needed to do to survive being blacklisted. And we had this conversation. I explained to him he's housebound. He's 94 years old. And I explained to him the blacklist was back. And at the end of the conversation, he shook my hand and passed me a $20 bill. Because that's what you do when your friend is on the blacklist. And the problem is that today, there are no blacklisted leaders of the left. No one on the left remembers ideological authoritarianism. Because you've got to remember that McCarthyism worked just like what's happening right now. The government didn't keep most of those lists. Most of those lists were kept by private corporations. The lists that kept you from getting work, the lists that kept you from being invited to events. Um, these It was because society had become authoritarian. It wasn't just the state. The state was just a small part of the picture. And the loss of that cultural knowledge that McCarthyism, that Zelsetzung in East Germany, um, that the, the Berea's NKVD in the Soviet Union, these things are largely staffed by volunteers. It's largely volunteers who have decided to become part of the authoritarian project. And the problem is that the left today thinks that because they're doing volunteer work for big pharma, that they're doing volunteer work for the military industrial complex, that somehow that's not part of a totalitarian order. When in fact, that's the essence mm -hmm. of a successful totalitarian order. Well, and, and when you mention that, I mean, the, the fascinating thing here is that a lot of the, the nemeses of the left, certainly of the Marxist left, the big corporations now, are capitulating to this thing themselves. I mean, I, I for example, a, a story I told on my show a few weeks ago. There's a in in my city of London, Ontario, we have a, a military uh, general dynamics uh, plant that makes tanks for Saudi Arabia or armored vehicles for Saudi Arabia. Now, this is an issue that you know I would think the left and the right should be able to be in agreement with. But you drive down the street and you see they had the giant LGBT progress flag with the rainbow and the the trans stuff, and I'm like, this is the military industrial complex making weapons for Saudi Arabia, flying the progress flag to say we love the trans folks, we love the gay folks, and and and. You look at all the big banks again. You know the the evil capitalist overlords. Every third bank in Canada flies this flag. Yeah, yeah, and and it's and and you know the the funny thing is is that the, these people that have have been the challengers of authority have won. And still, no one is good enough for them. Nothing is good enough for them. No, you're not good oh, enough for them. I'm not good enough. What, what happened is, right? You know how every election in the United States. There's this very, very boring story about there are white, educated Republican women in suburban Pennsylvania, and they will decide this election because the Democrats have finally come up with some pitch to convince these women to join. And then the vote stays the same. And people think then that the Democrats' pitch was stupid and didn't work. But that's wrong. Our political parties have largely swapped members over the past 30 years. Well, so I'd say even the last 10 in particular. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it accelerated. It began in the 90s and it reached its crescendo in the past 10 years. So, and, the, and it's interesting, the friends of mine who remain friends, but who are still on the left, because it's very hard to stay friends with me and not exit the left for fear of things that will happen to you. But the two friends who have, the reason they've been able to surf all this is that their class position changed. Hmm. Um, a friend of mine, he has been living in the V5L postal code his uh, whole adult life. Now, where and is that for those not in BC? Um, so this is Commercial Drive in Vancouver. It okay. is the wokest neighborhood 
west of Toronto. Okay. Um, basically, like you go down there and everybody's like got some kind of bespoke facial hair and they're wearing corduroy and riding a unicycle. Like it's insane down there. Um, just this giant corduroy unicycle sh show. And, um, but my friend's class has changed over that time. He moved there. He was like, um, you know, a rockabilly guy with a leather coat who came out from uh, a mill town where they made shingles. And, you know, now he's like a logistics industry consultant uh, who is uh, flies all over North America. To stay in that postal code, he went from paying $500 a month for a basement suite to purchasing a one-bedroom condo for a million dollars in the same postal code. Um, and so what we have to recognize is that the people who've been able to stay on the left have not maintained their class position. They have radically improved their class position. Working class people, I got into an argument with a guy who claimed to be a Marxist the other day about whether the true doctrine of Karl Marx is that you should hate the industrial proletariat. And I'm like, you can't be on the left if you don't hate the proletariat. But like, I don't understand how people are saying this unironically. Mm. I don't understand how people don't, when they express views like that, recognize the absolute absurdity into which they have marched. But... Um, certainly if your class status is insecure, staying on the left is incredibly important right now. How else can you impress rich people? Now, I also do want to suggest that this diversity, equity, and inclusion stuff, this thing where the corporations put up the pharma pride flag and they go woke and the military industrial complex, oh, right, produces queer nukes. Did you see this from the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists? I did not I know about queer news. The doomsday clock for my whole life. My whole life I've been going, this doomsday clock is very credible. It's measuring how close we are to total annihilation. Well, the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists have changed their position. We're not trying to denuclearize anymore. They don't want to decommission the nukes. They want to, I'm literally quoting the Bulletin, queer the nukes that if they just make all the nuclear weapons gay they won't blow us up um and i i'm looking at this like like like, like how is anyone taking themselves seriously in a context like this things must be totally insane to have reached that point where it's like, never mind banning the nukes. That's what we fought for our whole lives during the Cold War. The flag Let's on them, and then they're all fine. Yeah. So when we we launch it on, uh, you know, Putin's Moscow, it'll at least be the nice it's rainbow radio. colors going through the sky. Uh, it's a clear nuke. Um, wow. So, and that's part of the problem here. Like, one of the things we're trying to do, part of the absurdity of a show like this is we are trying to respond rationally to what has happened to the political left. And certainly class insecurity is playing a big role here. Certainly fear of cancellation and other stuff is playing a role here. But none of it can fully account for how completely insane this thing is. If we had read a William Gibson novel in the 1980s, you know, when cyberpunk was a new thing, when the, the horizon of dystopian fiction was a near future, ecologically impoverished cyber society. If William Gibson had created a social movement that believed that we all had pre-existent, undetectable, gendered souls 
that God was putting in the wrong bodies with increasing frequency. And the only way to emancipate society was to cut off the primary and se secondary sexual characteristics of children and sterilize children, primarily focused on indigenous, gay, and disabled children. If there were like a, ma there were this social movement that believed in this mass sterilization project. And that also um, had a militia called Antifa that dressed in black masks and beat the shit of old ladies in the street. We'd go, Gibson, this, this doesn't hold together. I can't believe in a dystopia this ridiculous. How on earth could a movement, which, as we saw in Melbourne, right, there's this moment where Antifa is faced with two crowds, Kelly J. Keene and her Let Women Speak rally, and a group of Nazis. And Antifa ignores the Nazis and grabs a 70-year-old woman, yeah. pushes her to the ground, and kicks her skull in. We, we wouldn't believe that as a piece of fiction. We would go, why is it that if you show a progressive, a video of an old lady being beaten in the street by young masked men with bizarre cosmetic surgery and tattoos, and they look at me and go, I'm not sure who's in the right here. I need more context. <laughs> yeah, so who knows who the real bad guys are anymore, right? I, 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 there's no way this would have held up in a work of speculative fiction. Mm -hmm. Like this dive into the most like atavistic, bizarre madness. And that's the problem because we keep thinking this is a thing you can debate. And one of the things people keep saying, are we going to beat these people soon? Are we going to, you know, look at the polls showing that more and more people oppose gender weighing. And it's like, you don't understand authoritarians. Authoritarians, right, they look at Machiavelli, right? Machiavelli wrote this great book about how terrible 15th century Italy was. And he described, like, all the things that would cause you to get ahead in 15th century Italy. And some idiots went, oh, that, that's obviously how you should do politics, which is not what he was saying at all. But the point is that Machiavelli said that authoritarians don't want to be loved. They want to be feared. Being popular only gets in the way for them because their payoff is the knowledge that we're being coerced, that we're being forced, that that's, that's what they live for. And so when you look at these folks, they don't want to sell you an ideology you could agree with. They want to sell you something no one could agree with, something so inconsistent, so monstrous, so insane, that suggests that anyone who does not want to find disabled children and cut off their body parts is an evil person. That What they're doing is they're not measuring your agreement. They're not looking for agreement. They're looking for submission. Yeah, the, the, the no desire to persuade and win people over, uh, which I think was probably the hallmark of, of most activism over the last, uh, certainly the last 60 years. Well, that's right, because we live in a democratic society with a democratic social contract. And the idea was, if you want to get something done, learn to work with people who aren't like you. One of the things that helped to equip me for this, because God knows if I had been a regular leftist, I wouldn't have survived the past three years of my world being turned upside down. But I was an early campaigner for proportional representation for electoral reform that put minority voices in the legislature. And what a lot of people do not credit, particularly Fair Vote Canada today, is that the modern proportional representation movement in Canada 
was founded in the early 1990s by pro-lifers. So when I started working on electoral reform, I was surrounded by anti-abortion activists. Our biggest organizational donors were the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Mm. And so because my views have traditionally been so extreme, I had to figure out very early on how to do business with people who had fundamentally different convictions from mine and to find common ground with those people. There used to be a thing in the 20th century, I remember this from like the greatest generation. One of the things you associate with the people who won the Second World War is there were a lot of interfaith multi-partisan marriages where the husband and wife would joke about the fact that he always voted liberal and she always voted Tory, that they canceled each other's votes out every election for 50 years. And that was a thing we used to be proud of. We used to enjoy. We used to know how to experience difference. The left's obsession with diversity is entirely about its lack of diversity, its inability to manage diverse opinions and diverse experiences. Um, I don't know if you've been watching all of our major papers threatening Muslims with pogroms lately. But that's quite interesting. Yeah, and it's about how you can, I'm not saying this has happened to you, but it, how you can in today's society never change your position, but somehow find yourself dramatically uh, in a disconnect from everyone else because the world can move around you and leave you uh, in, a, as you've learned, a, a very lonely place among your old friends. And I know you've made new friends that you may disagree with on, on most things, but your experience and your uh, penchant for coalition building has uh, served you well. Uh, it's a piece that people should definitely read, Intolerant Authoritarians of the New Left. It's in Inside Policy, which is published by our friends at the McDonald Laurie Institute. Again, not a hotbed for uh, Marxist thought by any stretch but it's a great piece and Stuart Parker thank you so much for coming on today great to speak with you well thank you very much uh and uh yeah I, I'm really glad to be getting this stuff out there to your audience because I actually care about convincing people who don't agree with me well, the, you, you coming on with me will cement your cancellation on the left. So we'll have you uh, waving the mag, wearing the MAGA hat and flying the F. Trudeau flag before long. Uh, Stuart, great to talk to you, sir. Thanks so much for coming on today. That was Dr. Stuart Parker. And, you know, one question that I would have loved to have put to him had we had more time, and, and we may have him back on because I think it's an interesting topic, is this idea of the way the left views the right relative to how the right views the left. And one thing that strikes me here is that I know I'm generalizing, but I think when we look at communists, for example, we kind of just chuckle at them. Like, because if you're a, a garden variety communist in 2023, uh, it's like, oh, look how quaint that is. But, but the left does not view the far right with the same level of quaintness. In fact, anyone who is like, you know, even to the right of Justin Trudeau is viewed as a, you know, bordering on a Nazi or an outright Nazi. And, and that's the, I think the distinction here is that the right does not view the far left with the same level of fear and anger and venom that the left views the, the far right. And the problem then, of course, is how they define far right and how you can be far right without really even being right at all. Uh, but all of this is, I think, part and parcel of what Stuart and I were just talking about there. And it's that there are two camps on the left. There is the increasing majority of those that aren't interested in persuasion. They aren't interested in coalition building. They want power and they want control. And then there are the others who are increasingly just relegated to the far right with uh, the rest of us uh, because they don't go along with, in some cases, even just one specific thing, which might be gender ideology. So thanks again to Stuart and to those of you who tuned in. Hope you have a great weekend. We'll talk to you all next week with more of Canada's most irreverent talk show here on True North. Thank you, God bless, and a good day to you all. Thanks for listening to The Andrew Lawton Show. Support the program by donating to True North at www.tnc.news.